Upon first glance, there seems to be little of interest about a sea star. These creatures are fairly commonplace in the ocean, and to the casual observer they appear to be little more than charming bits of decoration in the typical tide pool. Indeed, many people don't really regard them as creatures at all, and given their often slow pace of life, it is easy enough to see why. That and the decided lack of features one would typically associate with an animal. There is no discernible face, or even head. While many sea stars have eyes, they are the sorts of eyes one would not readily recognize as such. Rather than more conventional appendages, there are arms with arrays of associated tube feet. There is no discernible front or back, merely the upper and lower surface associated with radial symmetry. Despite these oddities, the sea stars are a very successful group, which includes some of the most effective predators on Earth. Many of the predatory species have success rates that would embarrass some of the more charismatic predators one might see on land. Beyond this, the class conceals many intriguing little surprises. The sea stars, also known as starfish, are in the class Asteroidea. The name, despite its distinctly astronomical suggestions, merely means star-like. As such, it is an entirely reasonable name for a class that is filled with various star-shaped representatives. To be fair, the star shape is more a human conceit than an accurate representation of a vast spheroid of mostly hydrogen and helium undergoing nuclear fusion. Still, for a great many people, the mention of a star will conjure up an image far more akin to that of a sea star than the actual celestial bodies. So the name remains adequate, at least. I should mention at this point that a number of marine biologists greatly prefer the designation of sea star to that of starfish. This is mainly because the asteroids in question are not fish, are not closely related to fish, and do not resemble fish in any readily apparent way. Thus, the name of starfish is misleading at best. Granted, there are probably more important things to worry about in life, but for the sake of the scientists, I am happy enough to refer to these creatures as sea stars. To begin with, let us consider the life cycle of a typical sea star. Though the adult appearance is familiar to most people, the larval forms are decidedly less so. At certain times, and under certain conditions, sea stars will usually release vast amounts of gametes into the seawater. By simple chance, sperm just happens to meet eggs somewhere out in the ocean. The resulting embryo develops through a number of stages. A cluster of cells becomes a hollow spheroid. The spheroid involutes to develop into a larval body with bilateral symmetry. This tiny planktonic larva, known as a bipinaria, is somewhat elongate, with intricate fringes of cilia twisting and contorting across its surface. These cilia carry it through the water, and they help it to feed on minuscule particles by maintaining a water current across the mouth. Provided nothing eats the little larva, it develops further into a brachiolaria, which has a number of soft arms projecting outward from its body. In truth, these arms look rather like tentacles. Eventually, the brachiolaria develops a rudiment, a growth, typically at one end of its body. Not long after, it seeks out a place to settle down, quite literally. As the brachiolaria settles on the ocean floor, its metamorphosis continues. The rudiment grows and develops into the radially symmetrical form of the juvenile starfish. Meanwhile, the rest of the brachiolaria withers away and either detaches or is absorbed. All that remains in the end is a tiny little sea star, which slowly grows to become the more familiar adult form. So let us look a little more deeply into the anatomy and physiology of a typical adult sea star, and see what manner of structure and function underlies its rather distinctive outward appearance. While there are plenty of species with more than five arms, or rays as they are sometimes called, the most common pattern is five arms radiating out at equal intervals from a central body, 
While some echinoderms have a clear boundary between this central disc and the surrounding arms, the distinction is usually quite subtle in typical sea stars. The pentaradial symmetry is reflected in the internal anatomy as well as the external. Each arm has a radial nerve and a radial canal that connects to several ampullae and their associated tube feet. The radial nerves connect to a nerve ring in the central body, while the radial canals connect to a ring canal in the central body. This ring canal in turn connects to the outside seawater via a stone canal that ends up in a sieve plate or madreoporite. A fair amount of the central body is usually filled by a two-part stomach. The pyloric stomach has digestive branches reaching out into the arms, each of which has several associated digestive glands. Beneath this pyloric stomach is the cardiac stomach, which can be everted in most sea star species. There is no heart and no blood vessels to speak of. The water vascular system is the nearest thing to a circulatory system that a sea star has. The only other internal system that takes up any significant amount of space is the reproductive system, which includes gonads that occupy all of the arms to some degree. The outside of the body is at least as complicated as the interior, as it turns out. Though there are variations between species, a typical sea star will have tube feet, spines, respiratory papillae, and various sorts of pedicillariae. Each pedicillaria typically consists of two or three tiny claws arranged together with associated sensory structures. In sea stars, some types include a slender stalk, while others more or less arise directly from the body's surface. The spines are often short and relatively blunt, but in some species they can be quite elongated, sharply pointed, and venomous. The papillae are tiny outgrowths of the body wall that are relatively thin and delicate. They are lined with cilia, and these cilia keep the internal bodily fluids flowing in and out of these little structures to facilitate gas exchange. Though these outgrowths are relatively easy to damage, the nearby pedicillariae tend to form an adequate defense. Besides this, echinoderms tend to have a remarkable capacity for tissue regeneration. Technically, each tube foot consists of the internal ampulla and the external appendage, sometimes called a podium. However, when many people refer to tube feet, they are often speaking only about the podium. Regardless of such details, the tube feet have a number of functions in echinoderms. Being relatively thin-walled like the papillae, the tube feet tend to have at least a partial respiratory function. Their primary function, though, is either as locomotory appendages or as sensory appendages. Those that tend to function in locomotion have tips that are expanded into suckers, though adhesion to surfaces is more often a matter of chemistry than negative pressure. The more sensory tube feet, which often function as chemoreceptors and may even act as basic photoreceptors, tend to lack the sucker shape at their tips. One can usually find such sensory tube feet towards the distal ends of the sea star arms. Another organ found at the end of each arm, at least in some species, is a rather unusual sort of eye. It is in fact several photoreceptors grouped together, much like the compound eyes one might see in an insect. However, these eyes lack proper individual lenses. They can distinguish light and dark, and large basic structures nearby. Considering the fact that the sea star has no brain to speak of, such visual acuity is probably quite sufficient. Having an eye at the end of each arm does give these animals quite impressive visual fields, if nothing else. The body wall that separates a sea star's insides from the outer surface consists largely of a collection of ossicles, tiny pieces of bone, precisely articulated and joined together by a combination of muscles and connective tissue. This combination functions more or less as a skeleton of sorts, allowing for proper structure and coordinated movement. The connective tissue in particular has a few surprises unique to echinoderms, but we'll come to that momentarily. Let us see how all of these features work together when a sea star goes in search of a meal. While there are scavengers and grazers among the species of this group, a great many are decidedly predatory. A common pattern is seen in the genus Pisaster, commonly found in rocky beach habitats below the waterline. Such habitats tend to have dense colonies of mussels, 
These mollusks are firmly anchored to the rocks, and they are capable of holding their shells closed with considerable muscular force when threatened. The sea star has no teeth or claws to pry open the shells. However, this does not hinder its feeding in the slightest. The headless predator creeps along the surface on its myriad tube feet, held securely in place against even the harshest of waves. Its sensory structures allow it to taste nearby prey, and it follows the chemical cues to a suitable muscle bed. Once there, the creature selects a muscle and grasps both halves of its shell with its arrays of tube feet. Then, using the muscles and ossicles in its body wall, it begins to pull. Of course, such muscles must eventually tire, but this is where the connective tissue comes in. This connective tissue, sometimes called mutable collagenous tissue, can be altered quite rapidly by neural signals. It can effectively change its toughness and flexibility, ranging from becoming nearly as hard as bone to just about as soft as gelatin. As the sea star's muscles begin to tire, it locks its connective tissue into the hardened state and waits. While its muscles recover, the unfortunate bivalve is still actively pulling against the tube feet outside. So, the predator gets a break while its prey doesn't. Eventually, the sea star unlocks its connective tissue and resumes its muscular activity. This cycle repeats until the shell is pulled open. It doesn't need to be pulled very far open for what happens next. As I said before, inside the sea star's body are two stomachs. While the pyloric stomach remains more or less in place, the cardiac stomach is turned inside out and extruded through the mouth. It invades the interior of the muscle's shell and begins to digest the creature alive. Eventually, when all of the soft tissues have been dissolved away, the sea star retracts its cardiac stomach and moves on. What is left behind is quite literally an empty shell. While this may seem rather ghoulish, and appropriately so, there is a certain value in this voracious feeding. Where Pisaster is present, the local tide pools tend to show a relatively high level of biodiversity. If this sea star is absent, the region tends to be overtaken and overgrown by one or two species of especially competitive mussel. Without the regular depredations of these eldritch horrors, the mussels simply crowd out other forms of life. It is worth noting that Pisaster here is effectively functioning as a keystone species, a highly successful predator that can redefine local ecosystems, and all this with neither tooth nor claw at its disposal. I can personally attest to just how disturbingly effective this unconventional feeding mechanism is. Some years ago, I had the opportunity to observe a large specimen of Pisaster that was being temporarily kept in a saltwater tank for study purposes. The creature was fed on a fairly random diet of whatever invertebrates could be acquired from the nearby sea. Regardless of the prey, no matter how tough the defensive armor, the result was always the same. Within a day, all that would remain would be a shell, pristine and unbroken, and completely scoured of all soft tissues. Indeed, I suspect that this sea star was actually employed to obtain perfectly clean shells for a few personal collections. To give some idea of how disturbing this is, let us try putting it into human terms. Imagine that you had a room with an unknown predatory monster. You could place a person in this room, let us say it was a terribly nasty person guilty of suitably heinous crimes to avoid a guilty conscience at the thought. The next morning, when you check the room, all that you find is a perfectly clean skeleton of polished bone. Even the brain case is altogether empty. Even the marrow has been removed. That is akin to the ruthless efficiency of a predatory sea star's dining habits. This monstrous prowess perhaps reaches its peak in one of the largest known species of sea star, Pycnopodia helianthoides, also known as the sunflower sea star. This creature grows up to a meter across, and often has more than 20 arms, in contrast to the usual five found in most other species. It also moves at what might be considered a gallop, at least by sea star standards. This creature will devour almost anything it can get its tube feet on, and its scent is often sufficient to send many species in its habitat fleeing. It is well armed with pedicillary as well as tube feet and functions effectively as a top predator in its local ecosystem, 
Still, this way of life is merely one pattern of many, one type of eldritch creature. There are quite a few variations even within the class Asteroidea. At one opposite extreme from Pycnopodia, we find Calcita Noviginiae, commonly known as the Cushion Star. As juveniles, these creatures look like fairly typical sea stars. As they grow into adulthood, they develop a distinctly inflated appearance. It is as though some cruel prankster had affixed a bicycle pump to the hapless creature and forcibly expanded it until it reached nearly spherical proportions. The arms are technically present, though they are entirely lost in this new form, effectively subsumed into the rest of the body. Happily enough, despite this apparent oddity of shape, the cushion star does not appear to be terribly inconvenienced. It moves about as easily as any other asteroid, scavenging and feeding upon local coral polyps. Granted, this creature does play host to a number of unusual commensals and parasites, including creatures like the pearlfish, which seems to have a habit of occupying the insides of several types of echinoderm. Another coral-feeding species of sea star has a decidedly more aggressive appearance and habit. The Crown of Thorns starfish, Acanthaster plancae, is well named both in its common and scientific name. The term Acanthaster translates roughly into spine star. This species is endowed with an array of spines that any sea urchin would be proud of. These spines tend to break off rather easily, and they are hollow and filled with a fairly debilitating venom. This is perhaps just as well, as the Acanthaster is relatively soft-bodied as sea stars go. In normal population levels, these creatures happily go about their lives, seeking out suitable coral to consume. They use the aversible cardiac stomach, common to so many sea stars, to digest away coral polyps, leaving their skeletons intact. While this may seem damaging to the reef, it does allow for other organisms to gain a foothold, increasing the overall biodiversity of the ecosystem. Of course, it is possible for Acanthaster populations to rise to plague proportions every now and then, and this can be somewhat more damaging to the coral reef ecosystem. Even so, this phenomenon is temporary, and thus far, coral reefs have not vanished under the assault of such population booms. An interesting quality of Acanthaster, shared by many other sea stars, is its propensity for regeneration. It can regrow lost arms, as most sea stars can, but the severed arm may grow into a new sea star as well. Not all of the species in this class are capable of such feats, but quite a few are. Indeed, some species even regularly reproduce by fission. That is, the sea star literally tears itself in two, and each half regenerates into a new sea star. This form of reproduction is employed by several species, including the smallest known species of sea star. This is the paddle-spined sea star, Allostocaster palmula. These little creatures have spines that are blunt and flattened, reminiscent of paddles, and they grow to perhaps a centimeter across. Their appearance is almost cute, so far as any echinoderm could be said to be cute. Similar regenerative capacity is also seen in a somewhat famously blue species of sea star, Linkia levigata. This species is not particularly predatory. It tends to live more as a scavenger, and it is quite prone to severing its own arms intentionally. One of the more unusual sea stars, both in appearance and habit, is Labidaster annulatus. This species is found in Antarctic waters, and has a multitude of relatively thin, flexible arms that often exceed 40 in number. The central disc is relatively clearly divided from these arms, in a manner one might expect more from a brittle star than a sea star. This creature tends to hunt in a rather sedentary fashion, sitting atop a stone somewhere in the sea, and letting its arms extend up and outward into the surrounding water. These arms are covered with pedicillariae as well as tube feet. The pedicillariae snatch tiny prey like krill and copepods from the water. These catches are then passed down to the central mouth by the brigades of tube feet beneath each arm. This feeding behavior is seen in a number of odd sea stars, many of which are in the order Brisingida. These creatures tend to live in deep waters, lying in wait to snatch unwary little creatures from the water. One might expect such abyssal creatures to be rather lacking in eyesight, especially as the sea star's eyes are not the most refined to begin with. <laughs>
However, as it turns out, this expectation is turned quite neatly on its head by several species. One of these is Novodinia americana. This creature is bioluminescent and has some of the highest visual acuity seen in any sea star. It is believed that these particular sea stars may signal to one another with their living light shows. Of course, sea stars are not without their troubles in life. Sometimes they are the prey rather than the predator. This may be especially true of smaller species. One species, Terrastor tessellatus, dissuades its would-be predators with the production and excretion of rather large quantities of toxic mucus. This defensive measure has earned it the common name of the Slime Star. Sometimes, the greatest threat to a sea star is another sea star. The Sun Star, Solaster docini, is a specialist in feeding on other sea stars. Even the large and imposing Pygnopodia tends to turn tail and run when it catches the scent of an approaching Solaster. While predation can be troublesome to say the least, parasitism can be no less horrifying. This is exemplified in a genus of parasitic barnacle, Dendrogaster. The name translates roughly to tree stomach, a fairly apt description as it turns out. This barnacle does not look like a barnacle. Instead, it has a branching soft body as an adult. This body is found branching its way through the salomic cavity of any number of sea star species. Thus, though not precisely accurate, one could envision such an infection as resembling having a tree lodged in one's stomach. Still, despite the various parasites and pathogens and predators that beset and despoil the sea stars, these creatures manage to do rather well overall. They are quite common in the oceans, to the point of being easily overlooked and dismissed as little more than scenery. However, a closer look reveals true eldritch horrors. Headless creatures that clamber about on myriad limbs, tasting the water with translucent sensory appendages as they seek out their next meal. Thank you for listening, and I hope you have enjoyed today's little foray into the unknown. If you are still curious and wish to venture a little further, here are a few things you might consider looking into. If you found this video enjoyable, do feel free to leave a like. If you believe others might enjoy it, by all means, share. If you wish to see more of this channel, a subscription should prove quite helpful. Until next time.